welcome to this episode of Inside Legal ESG. We are so fortunate to have with us today Aragon St. Charles, the Global ESG Officer and Business Sustainability Management and Senior Operations Leader at Denton's, the largest law firm in the world. Aragon's background includes time at Hogan Lovells as well. His credentials include studies and degrees from University of Cambridge, Harvard Business School, and the University of Kent. It is clearly a huge honor and privilege to be talking to him today about all things legal ESG. Welcome, Aragon. Good morning, and you know, thank you very much for having me on the on this podcast. I'm I'm delighted to be participating. Well, we are absolutely delighted to have you. So let's start with tell me about your role at Denton's and how did that come to be? And when did it come to be? Um, so the decision to hire a, a global ESG officer was in fact driven at, at, at the most senior level within the firm. The global CEO, the chairman of the board and the board itself all recognizing the need for the firm to embed ESG into its strategic direction. And importantly for both me and for the role itself, for it to be a senior leadership role within the firm uh, that joins all global board meetings to ensure that ESG had a voice there. For myself, uh, the fact that my very first interview was with uh, Elliot and Joe, the global CEO and the then global chairman, was one of the things that, that attracted me to the position. The fact that the firm is clearly taking ESG seriously, giving it a seat at the table uh, mm -hmm. uh, and where I, I, I cannot help but believe the role should sit, uh, given its strategic importance. I couldn't agree with you more. How did Denton's find you? Uh, I found Denton's. So ah. I had happened to, uh, I think a, a colleague uh, or a friend had sent to me uh, some information that, that that Denton's was looking for the role. Um, uh, and so that's how I, I came across it and decided to to throw my hat in the ring. And what year was that? Uh, last year. Okay, last year. So you and I have had conversations before around legal ESG. And for me, and and why I'm intrigued with this is that for law firms, it really is two sides of a coin, right? You have to think about ESG in ways that you can serve and help and advise your clients with practice groups and departments and so forth. But law firms are also businesses. So what should law firms be doing as a business with respect to their own ESG? So talk to me a little bit about what Denton's is doing in both of those camps. Sure. Um, I, I think that Denton's is, is fortunate in that the firm has, has long had an established client-facing ESG practice, and it continues to develop now as, as rapidly as regulation around the ESG is developing globally and the needs of clients changing so quickly. More and more, we are seeing how clients ESG needs cross all practices, mm -hmm. whether it's litigation, antitrust, m and diligence, but also crosses all geographical boundaries. And so it would be hard not to recognize that the sheer scale of this firm, as you said, the largest international law firm in the world, does allow us to provide detailed legal advice on the ground mm -hmm. using our own local expertise. Now for the other side of the coin, I think actually the, the analogy is particularly apt because it, it, it is a different side of the same coin. And even though we may drive an ESG program for the, the multitude of strategic, financial and, and just positive outcomes that come from doing so, we shouldn't forget that having our own house in order is rapidly becoming an absolute requirement from clients. Um, and, and I think I, I would also be remiss in saying that offering ESG advice to clients without doing it yourself would be somewhat hypocritical. Mm -hmm. So for, for our internal initiatives, my role has been to build on the existing programs that are here, um, often quite local or regionalized programs, and to try to bring them together in a more strategic way. 
to give an example of, of some of the key things we are working on, uh, I, I come from an operations background. So I was a director of, uh, sorry, a, a, a director of operations in HR. I've been uh, Asia Pacific um, head of HR, uh, sorry, head of operations for um, Asia Pacific. So I come from a very operational back background. And we talk a lot, or I talk a lot about the operationalization of sustainability. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is an important step in embedding sustainability within our operations, as opposed to it being an addendum to our business, a nice to have as a something a little bit on the side. Ensuring that sustainability simply becomes part of our standard operational decision making processes means that initiatives are driven locally and at a functional business service level. I often say the greatest success that I could possibly have as an ESG leader is when I'm no longer needed because yes. it, is, it is simply being done at an operational level without anybody externally telling people what they need to do or giving guidance. But a specific example of what we are doing uh, might be a supply chain initiative. So this is we're in the process of launching this in collaboration with our global procurement team. And the initiative has a, a couple of functions. The first uh, acknowledges that our supply chain likely accounts for around 90 percent of our, of our firm's GHG emissions. This will be common for almost all law firms, professional mm -hmm. service firms. And so it's absolutely critical that we work closely with suppliers to help them to understand their own environmental impacts and to help them reduce them, thereby helping us to meet our carbon reduction targets. And incidentally, this is exactly what is happening with our clients. Yes, they have set targets. They have realized that 80, 90 percent of their emissions are with their supply chains. And so as part of their supply chain, they are now coming to us to say we need to see improvements. So just as what we're seeing from clients, we are also doing with our suppliers as well. Now, the second function is, of course, to analyze ESG risks across our supply chain so that we as a firm can make better procurement decisions, choosing suppliers that better align with our own ESG goals, and potentially excluding suppliers that could prove harmful to the firm. Now, another important uh, cultural direction, if you like, is one of uh, our overriding concepts that I've introduced, which is that ESG is everybody, everywhere. ESG is not me. I may be the global uh, ESG officer, but I, I am not ESG. We are all part of ESG and we all need to think about ESG. And so I think ESG, everybody, everywhere is key to various ESG and sustainability engagement initiatives, which aim to make it pervasive amongst the firm and to help everybody understand this is not just something for leadership or ESG professionals to be concerned with, but rather it's something that everybody in the firm can and should participate in. We want to try to show that how decisions that we all make, no matter whether small or large, can accumulatively make a significant positive impact and improve the firm's environmental performance. We talk a lot about the size of Dentons. If 22,000 people make small changes, Mm -hmm. The cumulative effect of that is significant. Well, and to go back to your point earlier, where your your ideal would be when you get to a stage where you've worked yourself out of a job, right? Because it's just pervasive and it's just the way business is done. I believe that's where we're going to get with the practice of law as well. ESG is not going to be a separate practice group. It's going to be the mindset and the lens through which lawyers serve their clients. Everybody will have that ESG filter on those ESG um, mindset and lens in serving clients. So it may not happen in our lifetime, but but I'm hopeful that it will that it will happen. 
I mean, Pamela, I think you'd be surprised at how quickly this is starting to happen. So w this week we've been having, so I also sit on our firm's um, ESG legal practice steering group. And th this week alone, we've been having a number of, of meetings across the firm and they are joined not just by ESG practitioners, they are joined by, lift and we are having presenters who are from the corporate M&A team, who are from yes. litigation teams, who are from antitrust teams, because we are see already seeing that we need to embed it within the advice that we give to clients across all areas. When you're doing an M&A deal, yes. if you're acquiring uh, a company in, in any part of the world, but particularly if, in, if they're in developing countries, you need to be assured that you've done ESG due diligence on those firms because that might not show up in the traditional uh, DD, but it may show up in a specific ESG due diligence. So we're already seeing this integration, certainly within Denton's. I'm imagining that other firms are starting to see this as well. So I think it will happen much quicker because it's a financial strategic decision. Yes. You cannot serve clients if you are not taking these into consideration these days. So I think firms are able to and will respond quickly when there is a client driven focus at the firm on how to meet the needs. So yes, I, I think it'll happen much. I, I think we'll certainly see it within our lifetime. I hope so. I hope you're right. Um, so clearly you've had some success in the short time you've been at Denton's, but tell me what, what has been the most challenging for you, if you can share that? No, of course. And and in, in fact, it relates to, to, to the size and scale of Denton's itself, as you might, might possibly imagine. So one of the biggest challenges for me certainly has been recognizing that one size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. So I came into Denton's with a a very clear idea in my mind of what we had to do as a firm, what we needed to sign up for, what we needed to do operationally. And then you see the, the size and scale of the firm and you start to realize that what works here is perhaps not going to work here. Mm -hmm. In fact, it might be detrimental here. Mm -hmm. It's clear that different regions, different countries in the US, even within different states and and there of course there is a political element to this as we've seen in the US mm -hmm. there can be widely differing views on ESG and what it entails and which of the E the S or the G is the priority yes in some parts of the world Europe for example environment is absolutely a key driver and this is being spurred by regulatory issues that yes. affect not just our clients but also us as a law firm mm -hmm. The Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive is coming into play and from next year or the year after, we will need to report as a firm ourselves. So we have to start measuring our emissions, whether we want to or not, and we do, yes. Yes. but whether we wanted to or not, we're going to have to because it's a statutory reporting requirement. Whereas in other parts of the world, you'll focus much more on the social or the governance aspect because mm -hmm. that is a key issue for those regions. And so... I, it, it reminds me not long after I joined the firm, I, I attended the global partner meeting and it was a, a fantastic opportunity to talk to lots of people about ESG and what we needed to do. And one of the I remember having a conversation with um, about scope one and about reducing scope one emissions. And one of our a, a small group of our African partners said, Aragon, you don't understand. We we can't give up scope one because in some of our offices we have power cutouts and the only thing keeping our office running is an electric is a is an, a, an oil generator mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when you talk about saying we must eliminate scope one emissions well, we can't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it had never even occurred to me that that was the case i know that some offices have backup diesel generators but it's highly unusual it had never occurred to me that this is a an, not regular occurrence, but not an irregular occurrence. That's right. In some of our other offices. And so it brought home to me, I really need to think carefully about one size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. So 
that's one of the biggest things I think that we've had to to, to tend with. And, it, and it's been fantastic to do so because it requires talking to all of these different regions, finding out what's important to them, what matters to them, the challenges they have, and then trying to bring that together into a into a the overall strategy for the firm. So you mentioned the size and scale of Denton's being one of your biggest challenges. So let's let's talk about the size and scale of your team. Do you have a whole team of people helping you that do this or or is this you doing the best you can being one person? <laughs> It's a great question. Uh, and of course, the sheer size, scale and geographical reach of the firm can be daunting, but it's also part of our strength. Mm -hmm. One thing we have done is this year, the firm has invested in quite a sophisticated ESG reporting and carbon accounting system. Excellent. So that we can actually measure our environmental impact across all of our locations. So determining our global carbon footprint was an essential step to setting targets to reduce our emissions. But this system is also able to track and measure much broader ESG metrics and risks, including supply chain risks, for example. So investing in this system was an important decision. But by having it now, we are able to measure our impact as a firm what we are trying to build centrally is, is a central global team of expertise. I recently hired uh, a senior sustainability manager for my firm, Dr. Daphne Ramaphosa. They say you should always hire somebody smarter than yourself. Uh, so Daphne is certainly the, the smarter half of our duo. <laughs> she provides an amazing academic background into uh, environmental issues mm -hmm. combined with over a decade of commercial experience. So as we build central expertise, we then work with, and again, part of the idea of operationalizing ESG means you don't need large ESG teams in each region or office. Right. You just need a coordinated uh, functional team of business service leaders, whether it's operations, facilities, corporate real estate, and so forth. So I think being able to measure our impact like this is important and having a small team of, uh, with hopefully expertise joined with operational teams globally who are learning this, bringing it as part of their roles uh, allows us to get the data we need to make key strategic decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to build ESG into our decision-making processes, as we've said earlier, rather than it being an, an ancillary add-on to the firm or a, a nice to have. Yep, or a side act, a side activity or a side project, and it has nothing to do with the, the firm strategy. That isn't going to work. <laughs> and it's one of the things when we talk to 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 Elliot, for example, uh, our, 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 our global CEO, and it was a conscious decision to find somebody who was not a CSR professional, mm -hmm. uh, who you know, he doesn't come from a responsible business team, but also somebody who doesn't come from marketing. I know a yes, lot of yes. places they put this in their marketing team. And the concern there is, what are you actually trying to achieve mm -hmm. if this is in your marketing team? Marketing is valuable service area, business service area for ESG but it's probably not where your ESG professional should sit. Yes. To me, it sends the wrong message that we're just trying to say how good we are yes. rather than actually focusing on operations and making changes to prove yes. you're living what you're, what you're saying you're doing. And I think that risk is true with some of the other departments within a law firm too, right? If you put this in the legal, in the general counsel's office or the legal department, then it's just compliance. Or if you put it in this finance department, well, they're just filling out annual reports. You know, marketing, you get, this is just a PR stunt. So I think your position where you're independent of all of those departments and you're reporting directly to the chairman and the CEO, it, it sends such a powerful message internally as well as externally about the importance you, you're putting on sustainability. It's huge. I, I couldn't agree more. 
So what advice would you offer to law firms who might be considering a position like yours or to those who are considering those who may be considering such a position within a law firm? Well, I think you've touched on on the key point. So if, if law firms are, are looking to create a position like this now, I, I would wholeheartedly recommend that they do so. Um, I, I would wholeheartedly recommend that they make it an independent position, i.e. not within one of the other functional areas, but make it a unique uh, functional position mm -hmm. that will work across all of the functional other functional areas, including supporting the legal teams as well. Because as you said, clients are making demands, partners need to be aware of this so that they work hand in hand. That's why I sit on our legal ESD practice steering group as well, and members of their team join our the work that we're doing. I would say make it senior because you can't actually drive change if it's at a junior level. You have to make this a senior level position. As I said, one of the things that attracted me to Denton's, I join all global board meetings mm -hmm. uh, along with diversity, our, our, our diversity and inclusion officer. So we have a seat at the table. We can offer advice real time. We can suggest things in the room as they're happening and what effects they may have from an ESG perspective and bring our expertise to the table. And I think that's very important. Before and during decision-making. Exactly, because it's too late afterwards. So yes. you've got to be at the table. But it also means you need to hire somebody that, as I said, links back to it. They don't come from a CSR background. You want somebody who has commercial, ideally you want somebody with commercial experience who understands that we are part of a business and the purpose of that business is to, is to make revenue. If we don't drive revenue, then none of these amazing things that ESG can help with can happen. Yeah. That's right. So having somebody with commercial experience, I personally think is incredibly important so that when you have discussions with partners, you understand what their concerns are. You understand what's driving certain types of decisions and you can change how you're explaining things. You can you can help them to, to frame arguments in ways that different parts of the firm will, will understand and will resonate with them. Because I think that's the only way you can actually drive change. If you only focus on trees, mm -hmm. then maybe some partners are not going to understand that. They're not going to care about that. Right. If you focus on how ESG can actually drive revenue, well, that's, an inter that, that's a discussion that all of the firm is going to be engaged with. If you're talking with um, junior lawyers, if you're talking with most people within the firm and you want to talk about the, the good that you're doing, they'd like to hear that story. They may be less interested in the revenue side, but they'd like to say, well, what are we doing? Yes. So being able to, to use the relevant arguments at the right time and with the right people, I think is key. So find somebody who, who is able to make those distinctions and those analogies so that they can help the decision-making processes. And I think for people joining a law firm, it's just to understand that law firms are generally driven by partners who have strong business sense. They are owners of the firm. And so the decision-making process may be very different to a standard company. And I think understanding that is important for somebody coming into a law firm. Otherwise, they may approach, the approach that they take may not work. To put it mildly, decision-making in a law firm is very different than a real, than a, a, a centrally structured um, company. And uh, those of us who have worked in law firms certainly can attest to that. So you mentioned earlier how quickly ESG is evolving and moving and Given the state of how quickly it's moving, what do you find encouraging? And then maybe I'll also ask, what do you find discouraging? This is a really interesting question, Pamela, because I, 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 will, I will say honestly that there are days where I feel quite 
discouraged mm -hmm. at where ESG is heading, or, or perhaps not where ESG is heading, but where the world is heading. Mm -hmm. um, there are days where I can feel quite worried that am I actually making a difference? Uh, is what we're doing enough? Mm -hmm. um, so I won't lie, there are moments, I have moments of doubt um, throughout my role. And I, and I think it's important to recognize that because it isn't all great. Right. And there are very, very real challenges globally that we are facing. And I, I, I worry we are not facing them head on. And I worry that we are not facing them quickly enough. But there are also many reasons to be positive. And whenever I feel a little down, I, I just need to focus on that there are many positive things out there. I think there is a great upswelling of a desire for change mm -hmm. amongst a majority of the population. And particularly younger generations, uh, mm -hmm. up to 90% you see in some statistics, 90% of millennials and Gen Zs uh, are looking at the firm or a, a companies or our firms purpose mm -hmm. to decide who they want to work for. They don't just want to work for money. They want to feel that they are part of an organization that is doing good. So it's encouraging to see that in our workplace. It is encouraging to see so many of our people broadly across the world sharing that same idea that we need to do better, that we need to consider broader stakeholders. We need to look at the word stakeholders in a far more broader sense, rather than just stakeholders in traditionally shareholders or yeah. those who are taking profit, but mm -hmm. stakeholders being all employees communities that we serve in, suppliers, third party vendors, mm -hmm. a, a broader ecosystem. These are all stakeholders in our firm. And we see a lot of people looking to see what are we doing with our stakeholders and they want it to be positive change. We are seeing a lot of regulatory change, which whilst it may be challenging for us as a firm, CSRD being one of them, mm -hmm. it creates a, a, quite a burden on organisations that have to start reporting. But it's also a good thing because it forces you to look at what you're doing, gather those metrics, data-driven uh, decisions, and to look at what you're doing and how to improve. So there's, it's okay to be discouraged occasionally, just don't let it overwhelm you, I, I, I would say, and um, focus on where you can do good. I think if you only look at what's discouraging, it, you might get paralysis and, yes, and say, well, yes. I, I might not just, maybe it's just not worth doing anything because it's all yes. hopeless. But I don't think it is. I think technology is developing at a vast pace at the moment and we'll see new solutions. We see new solutions coming online. I think the, the pace of upswell of people being concerned about this is, is increasing, which will drive change in time. So I think there are many reasons to be to be hopeful for ESG and sustainability. I completely agree. And, and I'm so happy you feel that way. And I, I would say that that feeling of um, lack of optimism is it hits even harder if you're like a department of one and you don't have any internal colleagues or peers whose job it is to focus on this. Yes, you have, you know, cohorts in the other departments and you know, you've embedded ESG into the operation side of things and everyone's working on it, but it's your baby. And if you're all alone and feeling discouraged, it, it amplifies that, that discouragement. So we have one final question left. I clearly am going to invite you back next year because this has been an, an intriguing conversation. What will have changed when we talk again in one year? So I, I think I, before, so we were saying the flippant answer is I, I'm going to probably have slightly less hair on my head <laughs> in one year's time, um, but that's okay. But in terms of what the firm has achieved, what I would hope that by 
if we were to speak again in a year's time, we will have measured the impact of a firm that has 220 odd offices in 80 over 80 countries. Mm -hmm. We will have actually measured our impact. We were able to see where our, our greatest impacts are and advise the strategy to reduce those harmful impacts. And we will be well on our way to implementing the carbon reduction plan to reduce those impacts. I would hope to be able to say that we have broadened engagement across the firm so that we really are touching from an ESG perspective, everybody everywhere mm -hmm. and that all of our people are engaged in some form of, of ESG and sustainability across the firm. That is what I would like to see uh, in one year's time, it, it, it's a short amount of time, but you can create a lot of change in a short space of time. So that's what I would like to see. Uh, and it, and it, sounds, it sounds like you have already created a lot of change in a short period of time. So I don't doubt for one minute that when we talk a year from now, you will have another great story to tell. And what I love about that is Denton's example um, can grew very insightful for other firms who are just starting on this journey. So I, I appreciate so much your willingness to share everything you shared today. And I look forward to talking to you in a year. Thank you, Aragon. It's my pleasure. And Pamela, can I just say one last thing? One of the great things about being in ESG and sustainability is that we work together, in this case, very much a, a, ra a rising tide floats all boats. I often have leaders from other law firms reaching out to me asking actually I've just been assigned DSG what do I do mm -hmm. and, and and we talk together and we want to achieve this together so I think this is a unique role amongst law firms in that we are absolutely working together on this because we all want to do better and I think that is another thing that's particularly heartening is when we are all working together it's not just about making Denton's you know, exceptional at what we're doing from ESG. We want everybody to be exceptional as well because it benefits all of us. Th that's a great thing to be part of. I, I completely agree. And I feel the same way. I often feel like, you know what, we all win if we all win. So in this area, sharing and encouraging and collaborating is a really, really good thing for all of us. Thank you for collaborating with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Pamela. Okay.